and we are now recording. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, on the agenda today, let's kick us off with our vision and charge. And we'll talk about uh, the town manager's goals as well for the year. Thanks, Stephanie, for sending that. So um, again, we're here to make sure that we're working cooperatively with the town and community to raise awareness and move with a sense of urgency. And then uh, we have some uh, items from our CARP around planning and prioritizing cross-sectional efforts and then recommending programs for GHG goals and climate resilience planning. These are all part of FY23 goals for FY22, sorry, calendar year 22 goals for the town manager. And then the new goals for the town manager for the current calendar year. We'll just highlight the ones that are related to us. Oh, right there. I don't know if all of you have seen it, but around climate action, uh, it has a lot of things that we wanted. So climate lens, uh, using climate lens when making budgeting, construction, repair, hiring, and other decisions. We have the CCA item here around the joint powers entity. We've got the waste hauler bylaw in as part of the town manager goals. And then there's got uh, there's a lot of uh, actions around our CARP, uh, completing the fleet vehicle inventory. So we've got the transportation covered, um, obviously doing a GHG inventory this year. And then um, there's a heat pump program and CPACE as part of the goals. And this is around um, implementation of a plan for both heat pump program and utilization of PACE, completing the solar assessment, supporting the work of developing a solar bylaw, which I know Dwayne's been working on, um, completing a municipal building inventory of HVAC systems and timeline for electrification, and then the dashboard. And it um, jives well with our pillars here, and we can talk about whether these priorities need to change. Uh, the heat pump program made it to the town manager's goals. Uh, we got the solar bylaw and the assessment that made it to the goals. We've got one element of transportation. Again, we got to start thinking about what exactly we want for transportation next year, because um, we don't have defined goals other than inventory assessment. Um, so Stella, we just need to keep an eye out for when we create town manager goals for next year. And then we got CPACE as well. That was part of town manager's goals. Any questions on the town manager goals and items that we might have significantly missed out on? Okay. And then in terms of uh, our metrics, we have, uh, I don't know what the participation is. Uh, I think the last week's participation was, uh, I believe, two people attending, um, and then education series at four. Got to keep an eye out for annual report and town manager goals this year. I'm starting to do it more proactively, and then uh, the expense report, either semi-annual or on an annual basis. I believe Stephanie, you said the first week of August is when we'll have the first draft reviewed with us. Um, and then, Sasha, yeah. Yeah. did we do an annual report last year? We did not. Why not? <laughs> huh? Couldn't we do something, you know, simple, just yeah. to I, I, fulfill I don't think our charter that you know, at least goes through some of the basics. Steve? I, I just was thought we did last year, but I can't remember for sure. I just thought the same, but I can't remember either. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm remembering the year before. Because it, it went, you know, we started it, but it, it kind of went into January or February 
Um, yeah, I don't think we did. Pretty sure. We should. Yeah. Is it is it too late at this point to write a report? I mean. No, it's not too late. And and if we don't do it, then we can't like compare our years, you know? So Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think we just somehow just missed that. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. What, I don't know. What what yeah. Saying. What is the right timing for an annual report? Oh, is it the fiscal yeah, is it the fiscal year or is it the calendar year? And we when is the fiscal year? We have been doing it in the calendar year. I think we were trying to get it done by the end of um, December to get it in in January. So, um, but, I, and I can't remember if someone was asked if they would, because Andrew, I think you even sort of threw it out there for someone to maybe draft something. I, my recollection, because you had done it before. So I thought you had brought it up and sort of posed like, <laughs> would someone take the lead? <laughs> so, um, that's my recollection of this year. And I thought we had done something, but again, I'm, because I'm often um, providing information to Paul for his annual reports. So in my mind, reporting has happened, but that doesn't mean- We just use, um, you know, that for your part, that, that report and then I, put ours um, together. Yeah, if you want, I can, um, go back and spend a little time looking at um looking at that let's see should we think about doing this as part of our fiscal year instead of calendar year we know where the funds are being used just aligns well with putting a report together at the end of the fiscal year instead of the calendar year don't you think just going forward. I mean, I'm, I'm just suggesting should we wait until the fiscal year ends to write the report because we know where the money is spent and we would have a better analysis done. Well, there could. Well, I, Laura's Laura's um, weighing in that she thinks we should um, so. write something in the fall. And um, Laura, I appreciate your notes, but I just realized this chat should be disabled. So I'm sorry that. Yeah. Um, it's enabled. I don't know why I'm going to have to double check on that. But um, so Laura's comment was that we send the 2021 report in February of 22. Um, but things we discussed sending the report ahead of the budget guidelines and town manager goals that the council does. So thinks we should write something in the fall. And it should presumably cover all of the stuff we've done in the last year, which is pretty substantial. I mean, yeah. So I think we should make this an agenda item for a future meeting um, because I do think there's um, there's a benefit to ECAC submitting something to the town council ahead of these budget guidelines and town manager goals, which is our two oppor the two opportunities the town council has to influence the actions of the town government, I believe, in these spaces. Um, I don't, and then I think we should also consider what makes the most sense for Stephanie in terms of when she's reporting out things so that she doesn't have to do it multiple times. So um, like whether it's the green communities reporting or whatever that you do, Stephanie, like is that happening on a, on a, fiscal year basis, and in which case I think it makes sense for us to move to a fiscal year timeline, and that would work well with, I think, when these things are due to the council. Yeah, and when does the fiscal year end again, Stephanie? Is that April? June, June 30th. June, okay. June 30th. So um, just to sort of put things a little bit in perspective, so the Green Communities reporting happens, um, actually now it happens in November. It used to be December, but they moved it back a month. So um, that timing is kind of weird. And, and what I report back in green communities is sort of very specific to um, that program. So it's not as comprehensive as you'd be looking for. Really the more comprehensive reporting is um, 
what I provide to the town manager, both in his quarterly or monthly, whatever reporting that he does to the town council, um, I sort of offer what's happening with sustainability for his reporting. So, um, and those happen a little more regularly than just annually, but like annually there's like the big, let's look at everything. So, um, you know, I can certainly pull information from what I've submitted to him over the last year. Yeah, so, so is the consensus then, should we follow the fiscal year guideline to cr create a report and it aligns well with this action item when going forward, we do wanna send or discuss town manager's goals for the following year in August instead of later. And so if we, if the fiscal year ends in June, we'll plan to have the report done in July and then have the discussions around what our town manager's goals need to be for the following calendar year. Is everyone good with that? The, the next one would be reflecting more than the fiscal year because we haven't reported since 2021. So we'd have to do fiscal year plus. Half. Yeah, it'll be 16 to 18 months or something. <laughs> we just have to call that out in the report. I'll just look back at what I've reported on to. Okay. okay. Just a point so, of order. Uh, perhaps I, I got on a couple minutes late, but it's, um, I think it's my turn to take minutes. But if somebody else is taking minutes, um, that that would be great. Yes, yeah, sorry, Dwayne, forgot about that. Um, Andre went last time. Uh, I'll have to look at the last meeting. I'm also who's after. And and I I actually made a note to myself last last meeting that I saw I was next, so I was prepared and I got some of this down. Um, but uh, I wouldn't mind a clarification of what the proposal is or informal proposal with regard to when we're writing a report. Yeah, thanks, Dwayne, for taking notes. And uh, yeah, my my proposal here is to have the report completed at the end as it lines up with the fiscal year. So in July is when we complete the annual report and then the lead up to a discussion on town manager goals for the following calendar year. Well, that, that doesn't, if you're trying to align it with Stephanie's work, that's not, you know, it's like the end of the quarter is when she's putting together that, and, right? But not always exactly. And uh, I just heard end of the quarter, you weren't very clear. Can you repeat that? Oh, my cat is, Taking over my mic. Um, yeah, I, I don't see how the timing, how that timing is any better. Um, why don't we figure this out after maybe some, you know, input from Stephanie at another meeting? Yeah, it would give me an opportunity to look back, Basu, and I think Laura had recommended that this be an agenda item for another meeting, so, because I think we could probably spend a lot of time on this right now, which we have two presenters waiting, so I, I think we should. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Give me a Let's, chance. Uh, to look back. Yeah, we can take this discussion at the next meeting. Okay. All right, and I, we don't have the minutes from the last meeting, so we would have to postpone that as well, right, Stephanie? We'll just vote. I yeah, move to accept them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, let's open it up to the public for comments. Okay, if there's anyone in the public who would like to ask a question, make a comment, please electronically raise your hand to speak and I will unmute you.
We have four members of the public currently, but no one is raising their hand. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. And uh, we have Adrian, and you have Adrian, right? She's part of the yes, panel. I'm here. Oh, okay. Great. Take it away. Great, great. I'm going to share my screen. Um, it's nice to see you all again. I'm here to provide an update on the um, the assessment tool that we've been working on and also to provide you an update on the community outreach. We have a lot going on um, and a really busy month ahead of us in terms of this project. Um, so to start first with the assessment, uh, we've been working as a technical team um, within, within the town to develop a map-based assessment of where solar um, could go in town. Uh, and so we started kind of by filtering out where it would be allowable, um, just based off current regulations. And then we ranked the feasibility of the allowable area. Um, and I do really wanna call out, you know, I know there's a lot of kind of different definitions of feasibility, but we looked at that in terms of the potential to do something easily or conveniently. Um, so when we show the map, you know, if there's an area and you think, oh, right here could be great, you know, it, it could be. Um, you know, there's different levels of effort. And so we just sort of looked at um, kind of the, the relative ease of one area compared to another. Um, so it doesn't mean a, a definite yes or a definite no. Um, and then we characterize that land use, um, the, the current land use of the areas. Um, so our process um, started with overlaying a grid on the entire town. Um, and that gave us some really fine resolution about what's going on on the ground. Um, and then we excluded um, grid squares that were owned by the colleges and universities since they already have um, renewable targets and they've already started working towards those. Um, we also then um, excluded grid areas uh, where solar development is prohibited or would otherwise be really logistically infeasible. Then we did the ranking um, and then we classified the remaining grid squares. And so in our final report, there'll be really a lot of detail about exactly each criteria, but I've kept this presentation um, somewhat high level. So in that first step, we did our 30 foot by 30 foot grids. Um, this offered two benefits. Like I said, the first is really pretty fine grain, um, detailed information about what's going on on the ground. And um, it made the outcomes of our assessment a little bit more future proof. Um, as we all know, parcel boundaries can change and that's generally the other way to do this is looking at a parcel. Um, but parcels can be cut up, they can be changed, they can be combined. Um, versus, you know, these grids aren't really going to, to change um, in terms of, of that ownership or that total geometry. Um, and it allowed us to say kind of what's going on in this 900 foot square foot area. Um, instead of at a parcel, again, we might say, oh, are there wetlands on the parcel? Yes. Well, do we keep that in or do we exclude it? Um, the wetlands could maybe just be a small corner of a parcel. So we really felt that this was the best way to give us um, detailed information. Um, then, as I said, we excluded grid areas owned by the colleges. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. But then the other excluded areas, um, were those excluded by regulation? Those are wetlands and streams, the Wetland Protection Act and the town um, wetland bylaw uh, significantly discourage uh, and in some areas prohibit uh, wetland development for solar. So those were removed from our assessment. Uh, we also removed land that has some type of a deed restriction on it that prohibits development. So that would be conservation land in town, um, agricultural preservation areas, the state forests um, on the southern edge of town, and then there's some other miscellaneous um, conservation lands. So that is based on recorded deed information. And then the logistically infeasible areas were roadways, um, railroad lines, and utility rights of way. Um, and at the end of the day, this actually excluded almost two thirds of town. Uh, so there's about 6,600 acres um, based on this assessment where solar 
could go. So then within that area of where it could go, um, we looked at the slope, so how steep the land is. Um, solar is, is more feasible on flatter land. Um, we also looked at the aspect, so which way is it facing? Again, north you know, would, would result in less electricity generation than south. We looked at the capacity of the nearest three-phase line, which represents um, how much electricity the grid could take at any given location and then the distance to the nearest three phase line. Um, the longer the electricity needs to be run to get on the grid, generally the more expensive it would be to develop. So that's kind of where that, that feasibility or that inconvenience comes in. Each of these uh, factors was ranked individually from zero being low to 10 being high. So, you know, flat, flat land facing south, really close to the grid where there's capacity, that gets, you know, a 10. Um, that's kind of uh, a very feasible, relatively easy area to build solar. Uh, you know, the steep slopes, less feasible, that would get a lower score. Um, so these scores were assigned individually um, for each of the four characteristics. And then they were integrated into one final score. Um, and again, that score ranges from zero to 10. And we wanted to be somewhat conservative. We know that um, this, this committee will be looking at some estimates of solar capacity and solar generation um, so that we, you know, we, we took kind of a conservative approach at each step so that the estimates didn't come in really astronomically high. So when we did our scoring, we kind of biased towards lower scores. We, we made sites, um, you know, we tried to account for, for the challenge versus accounting for the ease. Um, and then at the end, what we did is we, we classified our remaining areas by the built or the unbuilt environment. Um, so this is the map of Amherst. The black areas are excluded. So you'll see that um, it's a pretty significant amount of town, like I said, about two thirds. Um, and then the remaining areas are, are color coded here. Um, between the open space, the agriculture and the forest, that's actually about 86% of town is considered unbuilt and about 14% of town um, is considered built. Um, so that's our, our commercial and industrial and residential. Um, so I'm gonna pause here uh, for questions from this group about the assessment. Um, as I said, much more detail will be in the final report, um, but I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Yes, Steve. This, this looks great, Adrienne, and, and um, your explanation and the document is really clear. When I look at that map, that little thumbnail image, it doesn't look two thirds black to my eyes. <laughs> um, that's just an observation. The question I think I have, um, you're evaluating the feasibility. Um, oftentimes reports will distinguish between the technical potential and the economic potential. And it seems like you're getting at aspects at least of the economic potential through the ranking system like slope and distance from, um, from the grid. But will you, I guess, are you going to develop work on the economic potential as a subset of the technical potential? Um, no, the economic potential is not not part of our charge. Um, okay. So that's yeah, just looking at the the overall ease. You know, like you said, that kind of combination in the ranking, um, and how much area falls within each category, uh, so that that the town can make decisions about prioritizing. Um, but but we're not specifically separating that. Okay. And then are you evaluating rooftop and parking lot potential at all as part of this? Yes. Okay. Yep. So rooftop and um, parking lot is included. It's within that, that built area, um, but then it does get, it will be broken out into the different capacities um, on each area type. So those will be in some tables with the final reports. Yeah, great. 
Um, and then when the map goes up publicly, is it going to be interactive? Are people going to be able to like zoom in to particular areas? And are they going to be able to like change the rankings that you guys have used and play around to that? They will be, it'll be um, similar to, I don't know if you've used the other GIS maps on town in terms of like the property map. It'll yeah. be similar to that where they can, there'll be, you know, property boundaries. Um, you know, they can change the background map. They can zoom in and see in more detail, but they they cannot change the data. Okay. And then the final question, the, 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 um, the smart, the Massachusetts smart regulations if a parcel, if I understand it right, if a parcel has more than 50% of its area covered with a bio map designation, then the entire parcel is disqualified from the SMART incentives. Does, does your map include that aspect? It does not include the bio map. Does not include the bio map. How about priority habitat? We did not include priority habitat either because it mm. can make solar more challenging, but unlike wetlands, it's not necessarily um, a boundary that would prohibit development. Um, so, you know, you can, depending on the existing habitat, um, it does require consultation with the state and permitting, but um, while you know, wetlands have a pretty straightforward boundary priority habitat. Sometimes you can develop part of a parcel and conserve part of a parcel. Um, there's different agreements that can be made. Um, you can put on solar, but improve the habitat beneath the solar, depending on the species. So there are a lot of site specific dependencies related to the priority habitat um, that lend themselves to being dealt with um, on a more project specific basis. Well, let me, maybe Dwayne can, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought that any parcel that had more than 50% of its area mapped as either biomap or priority habitat was excluded from SMART program incentives. So maybe it's not prevented, but essentially it is prevented because almost no one is going to be able to build a solar field without the SMART program incentives. Is that, Dwayne, does that sound right or am I misinterpreting it? Um, <clears throat> well, you're right in terms of uh, hard to build a solar project without the smart incentive. That being said, I don't know um, definitively of whether uh, your your suggestion that that uh, fifty percent of a parcel would w in those areas would um, disqualify you. That um, I'm not doubting that, but I don't know that definitively. Okay. And I don't, the, yeah. the source I'm using is, is from Zara, from your office, Glenn. <laughs> um, let me, let's see if I could, where did I put that? Um, if I could, may I share the screen for just a moment to share a link that shows a statewide map that maps out the lands that are excluded from solar based on the priority habitat and the bio, bio map project? Steve, before you do that, can I just jump in real quick? Sure. Um, so the the point of this mapping is not it's not definitive it's not to say you absolutely can or cannot develop solar in these areas it's looking at what is potentially the the more feasible locations so it it's going to require people who are proposing to do a solar project they might look at this and think oh this is a you know potentially i could do this but it's going to require more investigation, more analysis. It's it's not the sort of be all end all. So I think to Adrian's point about the biomap, it's just, it's to say that it, it may or may not be feasible. And again, incentives may, you know, that gets to the sort of economic piece and it may not be feasible just economically. But again, it's gonna require any solar development to still, um, this is just a place to start. It, it's just to say if the area is in black, it's very unlikely you'll be able to put solar there. But if it's in one of the you know other land use portions that are identified as not being in black, then it means you just have to do some more analysis. So I just wanted to bring that up because you know we didn't we didn't go down that road um, because it wasn't a hard and fast, right? It's going to require more analysis. 
Well, I guess, yeah, I guess that's my question. It sure sounds to me like the SMART programs exclude any parcel that has more than 50% of its area mapped as Biomap 2 or Priority Habitat. And if that's the case, then we don't want to show lands in Amherst that a potential are feasible for solar when in fact they are essentially not because of those regulations. Well, in part because we didn't do this by parcel, we did it by grid analysis. Well, so I know, but if entire parcel is excluded from the SMART program, that should be reflected on the map that we're, we're producing for Amherst. I guess my question would be whether um, in this interactivity of the map, whether there would be there would be a biomap and priority habitat GIS layer that users could turn on and off to see how it impedes or or overlaps with the non-excluded areas. I, I think that's a good solution. I'm just saying I think yeah. those should be counted as excluded areas if they are not already as part of the the work that mm -hmm. the, the GZA has done. The the map, well, I guess if if you'd like, I can share the screenshot that shows the address as well as a portion of the map. I can do that now or I can do that later. Go for it, Steve. What's that? Okay. Go go for it. I think yes, you're seeing it. So the, the background map is is here. Here in this box is the short URL for it. And the legend shows these areas that are highlighted in a bluish green, I guess. Those are areas with the red or pink outlines or parcels with 50% or more biomap two or priority habitat. So I guess my suggestion then, Adrian, is check out that map and check out the SMART program and decide whether those parcels should be excluded based on the SMART regulations. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I think it I think it definitely makes sense to include those layers in the interactive layer. Um, you know, I because this was not parcel based, this was just the the area, and we are looking at all types of solar by any kind of developer. You know, they may or may not use the SMART program. It might be rooftop. Um, and so if their parcel has priority habitat, but their house is outside the priority habitat, you know, they, I, I would think that they could still put solar on their roof or their garage. So we, you know, the, I think they're great reference layers and certainly developers or people actively pursuing solar on their property should be able to easily reference that. But I don't think that those parcels should be entirely excluded. Well, I guess that's where I disagree. If the SMART program excludes a parcel, now we're not talking about rooftop. If it excludes a parcel from ground mount, I think your map but should be. Our map that. is looking at everything. Okay, I certainly hope that it includes the biomap and priority habitat exclusions through the SMART program. If it doesn't, then you'll be showing land that potentially could host ground-mounted solar, where in reality it cannot. So a parcel can be excluded through that program, just as a parcel could be excluded because it has a deed restriction on it. But they we're only creating one map with all of the ratings. So we're not creating a ground mount map separate from a residential or a canopy. Steve, I think, you know, any any developer going through this process is going to have to go, you know, they're going to have to get in touch with, um, you know, especially if there's sort of um, any kind of conservation related issue, they're going to have to meet with the wetlands administrator. They're going to, so I, I think, you know, there's going to be But, but this is not for developers right now. The purpose of this map is to help the town and the town council to decide Sort of what kind of restrictions can we put on solar while still balancing the need for solar? And if the map shows a lot more area in town that's potentially eligible for solar than is true, then the town might sort of put more restrictions on land. Say, oh, there's plenty of land, so we can restrict this or we could exclude that through town bylaw. 
But if the map is not showing all of the restrictions from the state, then that's going to be misleading. So I think it's I important back, to include parcels that back. are excluded because of the SMART program. Okay, laws. I would push back, Steve, that this is not specifically just for that purpose. Well, it's certainly what that's the, the purpose this spring while the solar bylaw working group is working on the solar bylaw. Right. That's and while the true. town council is going to be considering whether to adopt it. Right, exactly. I mean, so I think, but there, there, it's a tool for the development of that, but it was never meant to be guiding. This, this assessment is, should not be specifically guiding the development of the solar bylaw. And I would refer to, I would look to Dwayne to maybe jump in on this point, because um, I think you would have a more, the ability to sort of articulate um, the, the purpose and sort of why we looked at it in the way that we did and created the sort of technical guidelines that we did. Well, we, we voted, the ECAC voted to recommend certain parts be included as this in this study. And again, if, if, if a parcel is excluded by the SMART program, it should be registered on this map as not feasible for solar, ground mount solar development. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, I think- Steve, I want to make sure I, that gets I, considered. No, I, I think that makes total sense. I mean, Dwayne, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah. Um, um, you know, well, I'll mention my thoughts, but then obviously it's also, you know, with whether uh, this is something that um, GZA can do, whether it fits into the uh, uh, methodologies and so forth and, and the and the budget that we have to work with. But um, I, I would agree with with um, Steve and Steve uh, in, in, in that this is not just for developers. This is probably going to be looked at more so by non-developers. I think developers have their own um methods and maps and 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 uh uh ways of going about doing these things they'll obviously make use of these this type of mapping but each developer has their own methods as well um i think <clears throat> to the extent that i i would agree at least for the foreseeable future that solar development is driven by the smart program you're not really going to build uh, certainly a ground mounted project of any scale uh, without the SMART program. Um, and I think uh, in, you know, uh, in my mind, it would be helpful to be able to show these areas that are excluded. Maybe it's a little bit different of a category of exclusion because it's not because of physical properties, it's because of the incentive program um, and, and the rules associated with that. Uh, but that um, I, I think it would be helpful uh, to show those uh again it's it's difficult because uh we're looking at it in 30 feet by 30 feet grids and you don't know whether that 30 feet by 30 feet grid is within a parcel that's 50 percent uh covered by biomap uh or priority priority habitat but there may be some methodology to do that um and so uh i i i would tend to agree uh and it was a bit of an oversight and in, 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 uh perhaps looking at the other um, uh, areas or, or uh, pro prohibitions that we uh, put forward in, in in the mapping so far, uh, but um, this would seem to be a pretty relevant one for for um, for the purpose here. So uh, I, again, I would I would you know ask uh, Stephanie and Andrea if this is uh, how big of a lift this might be, and 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 whether you would push back. I defer to Adrian and um, in terms of the how much of a lift this would be. And I, you know, and again, we have a budget, we have a timeline, so I'm going to refer uh, defer to Adrian. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I can't speak to the, the level of effort right now off the cuff to add this, but we had been tasked with developing this map. Uh, based on the feasibility for use by the town, for use to develop um, capacity estimates, but also for use by the general public across um, land uses. And so, you know, we were not we were not tasked to develop this in line with the SMART program. We were tasked to develop this, um, you know, kind of based on largely unchanging characteristics of the land, which is why we selected um, the criteria that we did um, as, as the committee. So, you know, I think we, you know, wetlands, 
the exact margins may change, but where they are doesn't change. Um, priority habitat does change. It changes every couple of years. Um, are areas where rare species are still the same? Largely, yes, they, but the, the edges and the boundaries do get adjusted. So um, I think that if we were developing this in line with the SMART program, that's a different task than was laid out before us and that we executed on. Um, I, I mean, I guess I do wonder so, um, whether, whether um, you know, basically the map that you had presented to us just, just now with regard to the excluded areas and so forth, and then the non-excluded areas, but then just a, ge a, a the layer that uh, Steve had put forward um, that shows what would be excluded under the biomap and priority areas per SMART regulations as uh, an overlay uh, that can uh, then, some of that's gonna cover, re cover over the already excluded areas and some of it will bleed into the um, areas that are non-excluded um, and if, if uh, if that, I, I don't know GIS uh, certainly as well, but if that's a, a fairly um, lower effort route um, to just be able to have a map that shows um, exactly what you had and then another map on the side of that that says, and here's the, the map with an overlay um, of the biomap of the excluded areas per the SMART program for biomap and priority habitat. Uh, the biomap and the priority habitat layers could be in the map. So yeah, they could be turned on and-, and Yeah, and, and, and in the report- Reference while looking at this and that, you know, that mm -hmm. would that allow would a good, a given good. property owner to, to see it. Okay, um, we're running out of time. I wanna be conscious of time. I know Kathy needs to leave at 5.40. So Jesse and Lori, real quick, any comments? I just really quickly, when you, someone does zoom in on this map and they get to somewhere where there's a rooftop that's, you know, maybe there's 500 square feet, you know, are you going <clears> to, <throat> what happens when there's a, a perfect place for solar on a roof, but it's kind of in three different 30 by 30 grids? Just, I'm just curious, like, how, how do you handle that type of thing? Yes. So that was, um, that's, looked at when it when yeah when we zoom in it's kind of whichever of the land uses is the most of that um grid so um when you when you zoom in the pixels might look a little you know a little scotched to the left or right because it, it picks that the grid can only be one thing but a grid square picks up the roof um and so when you zoom in you would see kind of the aerial behind it you see the roof part of it's classified that's similar to how other land use classifications, um, like the nat National Resource Land Conservation does it, they do a, a grid as well, a larger grid, but um, that's, how, that's how it's looked at. Lori? I don't have much to add. I just wanted to say that I agree that in some way this, um, uh, this, this, I lost the word already. The second map, the map of the smart program map should somehow be included. Mm -hmm. Adrian, when's your next update to us? I don't know that the next update is planned. Okay. This was um, a presentation of um, what we were considering the final draft of the project um, to be presented. So if um, you know, we may have to circle back with the okay. technical team, which includes Dwayne. Okay, just... but Adrian, the plan for now is having the layer, right, of the biomap. Yeah, That's... yep, on, on the town website, you can, you'll be able yep. to open the map and there'll be layers on the map that you can turn on and off, just like, um, you know, the town zoning layer. Yep, yep, okay, thank you. And thanks for your time. Mm -hmm. Um, I have, you. sorry, I have a, um, an update on the community outreach, but this oh. part's very quick. So I'll, Adrian, I'll just Adrian I'm just wondering, would just given Kathy's time, which I was not aware of, would we be able to hold that? Would you be able to sort of hang in there for a bit and um, hold this part of your presentation till after Kathy is sure. able to do hers? I'm sorry, we just, um, we didn't realize she had a, a time crunch. Okay, thanks. thanks.
And Kathy, I'll turn it over to you for the school building update. Hi, I apologize. I have another Zoom meeting starting at six and they just asked me to be there by 545. So that's why I sent you that note. Um, so I, I am delighted to be here and um, Laura invited me and I prepared a few charts to just focus on the school and I believe Laura has information then to share with you because we're looking to you all to take a look at what we've done in terms of the energy design of the school to provide some additional information that we haven't um, done so far. So have, if I can, um, did, do you have my slides? Because for some reason I couldn't get into your Zoom meeting my normal way. I do, um, I can share them. That'd be great. Just give me one moment. I kept saying exit the meeting you're in and I wasn't in a meeting so I went in I'm coming in through the browser in the sky which is an odd way to come in hey Kat, Kathy hi yes just so many when when you say we can you say just who that are you talking about the <clears throat> the building committee the town council like who's we when you say we Okay, let me uh, let me start a little slower now that my slide is up. Okay, I am a town councilor and I'm chair of the elementary school building committee. And we are at a point where we've just submitted the sem schematic design for the school. So we are now waiting the for the grant authority, which is the Massachusetts Skill School Building Authority to officially sign off on it. We've picked a site for the school. We've picked a design for the school, a location. Um, it's a three-story school, and we've picked an energy system. Um, the school has to meet the town's net zero bylaw, which means it's all electric, and it has on-site photovoltaic panels on the roof and on the parking lot that will generate enough renewable energy to offset the electricity use by the school. So we've had modeling done for us on the massing of the building, the daylight in the building on its likely kilowatt hours of electricity um, given its insulation and a lot of other features. So the we, the, the we is a very large we, a design firm named Denisco Design are our designers, and they also have Thompson Tomasetti as energy consultants that have done the modeling for them. And then we have a 13 person committee. And if you go to the next slide, Stephanie, I think I've got that on it. I hope. If I can, I can't advance it now. Yeah, so, so Denisco Design Architects are the design firm, but underneath them are a series of consultants. So both um, uh, groundwater environmental consultants on uh, what goes underneath the school, the foundation of the school. And this is the core, what the project is. Um, the school will be replacing the Fort River and Wildwood Elementary Schools. There's a scheduled move of the sixth grade up to the middle school, which means this school, as well as Crocker Farm or one of the other elementary schools will be grades K through five. We selected the Fort River site as the place for the new school. It will be three floors, all electric geothermal with the town owned PV renewable on site. Right now, the timeline has the big, the big date looming is the May 2nd vote. Um, the school is expensive and we don't have enough internal revenues resources to build it just out of savings. Um, so we are ask, really asking voters to do a debt exclusion, which is basically an increase in property taxes to finance the town share of the school. Um, and you, you see here a list of who was on the building committee. Um, that is the full list and there are people in various functions. We had a subcommittee that met on the net zero and sus sustainability design. Next slide. So some just basic facts about the school in terms of what we think we're bringing to the community. The entire design of the classrooms and the layout was driven by the education program with a lot of inf 
uh, input from the teachers on how things would be laid out. There was a real emphasis on outdoor learning as well as play. And the three store floor layout, I'm telling you more than you need to know as a committee right now, but this is an overview. The three floor layout is gonna have two grades per floor. And the way the floor plans work is fourth and fifth grade would be on the top floor. They will be across the aisle from each other with a shared project space. So the teachers are excited about the opportunity um, for shared learning. There was a real emphasis on bringing daylight into the classrooms um, with evidence that it improves learning, not to mention um, it lowers the use of electric light bulbs to light the spaces. Uh, we are adhering to the net zero bylaw and part of what we were doing was really getting the energy efficiency way down an EUI of 25 or less because that qualifies for Eversource's rebuilt, uh, rebates and incentives um, if we build with geothermal. So they want evidence that we're going to meet that. And th this is the 1.6 million is both construction. When the school is built, we get the money. And then we get another 200,000 if we hit the energy target. We compared to the existing schools, Fort River has oil and Wildwood has gas. We will be generating at least $250,000 a year in operating costs savings if we completely close the two schools. That's not the only savings. There's operating costs beyond that, but that's just assuming those schools aren't running anymore. And Laura got from me how much oil is used, how much gas is used, so she could talk about um, greenhouse gas and carbon footprint. Um, I think that is all I want to say on this, other than um, I have a longer set and anyone who wants to come to the community sessions, I can send you that schedule as well as a link um, going into some of these points on how much do we save by avoiding repairs. Um, the two schools that we're closing are po poorly insulated is an understatement. They're not insulated. They, they really are energy sieves right now, as well as not being up to code on wiring, on plumbing, on uh, ADA accessibility, and a series of other major pieces. And the oil, the various internal HVAC systems are in a state of collapse. We, uh, the kind wording about them is they're vintage. Um, which means for some of them, the parts are not available anymore. So we're expecting a, a facility grant for the whole project, the site and the project of $43 million, and it will be a community use. Um, next slide, Stephanie. So on this slide, I can't use my pointer very easily, but one of the advantages of the um, proposed site is you see this small dotted line north of um, the, the layout of the school, that's where the existing school sits. And the new school can be built while the existing school is occupied. Yes, thank you. While the, uh, and it's more than a hundred feet away. So we can set up a protective um, fence all around the construction site. If you go, that's a new loop that's down on the south side where the buses and vans will come in and out and the cars will come in north, but Stephanie, just south of that is where the geothermal wells are gonna be, be. And they can put them down and then cover it up and build this new new loop coming in. So the wells will be, the wells and the site work will be some of the first um, part of the construction project. They'll be put in over the summer. So the students in the classroom, which are pretty far north away, won't be subject to that noise, but they will be able to see the school being built. You know, so um, during one of the community forums, they said, will they be able to look in? And so the design firm said, we can probably do a burlap little thing. You can look, you know, lift a flap and look in, look inside, look inside to see what's going on in there. And she actually said, the person who asked said, I want to come and see this. The, the school is has got a north south orientation. Um, the little kink in it, it's got a little twist in it. You're seeing the bottom floor of the site that first where you see pink and yellow, those are the community spaces. That's a gym and that's a cafeteria. And above that will be the library. That can all be walled off from the classroom. So it's got a lot of safety features, but the big thing we were focused on 
in terms of locating the school with, was a north-south. So the classrooms where they're facing and where the solar panels will be on the roof, they'll be on the roof of the school and also on the roof, over, there'll be canopies over the parking lot. And the town will own these. We get all the energy. It's a full energy offset. Next slide. And anyone can interrupt me if I'm rattling on too much. So this was the modeling, the result of the modeling that was done. And right in the middle of the summer when Thornton Tomasetti was giving of this information, Eversource dramatically increased. They call them, um, what did they call them there? Uh, <laughs> Adders, they call them adders. I call them incentives. I just think of it as money. So for, for, for ground source heat pumps, the amount of money they're giving shrunk the cost difference between air source heat pumps so much that the, the much higher system suddenly looked like a no brainer to us because of the thermal comfort in the building. The thinner, the walls don't have to be as thick because of the way the system is ducted will be and there are chilled beams in the structure. And so that incentive, the pure construction incentive, you can see 200,000 and another 1.2, a little almost 1.3 million, we will get when the school opens. So that is just, if, if they agree that we've got um, an EUI of 25 or less because of we designed. So they're getting all the specs on the insulation of the building, the orientation of the building, the daylighting, and then, if we hit our target, a year later, we get the $163,000. So that's the post-occupancy. They'll come back in um, a year later. And just so everyone knows, we had to give them information on this on uh, after school use. So will this be used after hours? Will it be used in the summer? So we had to give them some sense of what when the modelers had to know it as well, you know, how how many hours would this building be operated? And I don't have to, having just heard the level of technical expertise that you have on this committee, you know, a lot of this can be in the basic design of the building, but users are gonna matter. The way we use the building will matter on how much um, we use every day. So um, if you go to the next slide, Stephanie, or I can just say this too, that one of the schools, um, Oh, this is one more piece before I get to the last piece of this. There are new federal credits and it's, um, it's hard to overemphasize how much this is a game changer. The IRS with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act has a provision that formerly tax exempt entities like towns and schools um, or nonprofits that don't pay taxes will the first time be able to get an up to 30% credit and they call it a direct payment because you can't get a credit against your taxes if you're not paying taxes. So what we don't know yet is 30% of what? Will it be the whole PV system? Will it be the whole GSP system? But this computation says if we applied it on the full cost of the ground source heat pumps and the solar um, what the credits would do. But in this case, I'm just showing the ground source. We were asked by the community with the HVAC system we have, how much more does it cost than a conventional system? So the designers gave us what a conventional system would have cost with gas, which would Fort Rivers on a natural, it has gas now. And that was around 8.3 million. And the combination of the Eversource incentives and the tax credits basically end up saying that we'll either be at an equal or will be less than the other system would have been because of these federal credits. And this is real money to the town. This, as, as we understand it, you know, it's the year after the building opens, it's like your house, you put solar panels up and this is not counting the up to 30% for solar panels. So next slide. And then I think I am finished. Um, except for my timeline. So th these are the various features of it that are related to sustainability as well as net ener energy. They're gonna be low flow toilets. The water consumption is gonna be held down. Um, the way the daily is arranged um, reduces electric use. I was in a school that Donesco has designed in Lexington during the daytime in the gym and there were no lights on in the gym. And when I went into the Fort River and Wildwood gyms, there were no 
windows in those gyms. <laughs> so it didn't matter how much sunlight there was. There are, there are solar, there's on the south side of the school, they put up some window shades so you won't get glare, you know, to, to hold it down. The HVAC system that uses ground source is extremely quiet. And again, I don't know enough technology wise, but we saw two schools on a over hundred degree day. And the first one was more conventional. And when we were in one part, we were freezing and another cart, we were hot. When we got into the other one that was, the system was ground source, there is, there was no notable change as we walked around the school. I mean, and, and it was amazingly quiet. I think one of the exciting things is, um, this is a learning lab for our kids, not just the town. Um, there was a, there's a wonderful film that a school in Northern Virginia produced after the school opened, which has kids, parents and teachers talking about the school. And one of the moms said, my child keeps running around the house unplugging things. And then he comes home and tells us how the school did today. But 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 this the it was an elementary school. The teachers built some things into their curriculum about energy and about environment. Um, so I um, the last one, if you click to it, Stephanie, I think is the timeline. Yeah. So this is the basic, the school is, if, if the residents vote, it's on a schedule to open in 2026. And there's some more details on this timeline, but I'm gonna stop there because um, I, I wanna make sure you hear from Laura because we have not done the carbon footprint or, or greenhouse gas. The designer was willing to do some of that, but I gave, Laura got from the designer, but actually from the school, literally how many gallons of oil do we use and how many therms of gas do we use? So she was able to compute current schools versus this school. And she has the information all of you have pulled together on greenhouse gas and targets for all of Amherst. So I will stop there, but happy to take any questions and you can take my chart set down. Hey, Kathy, what uh, question, uh, what pushback, if any, are you hearing from the community? I, I, think, the, I think the big pushback will be um, how much is my tax going up? There is nobody, the, the reaction, and what I'm not showing you, and I, do, I will send the community schedule, if you haven't seen it, the design team did a virtual tour of the building, and it's gorgeous. Um, so I've shown you some not pretty, you know, the tour around, walking around the outside of the building, then what happens when you walk inside the building, uh, the reaction to, um, of teachers uh, has been, um, they'll, they'll have a quiet space to teach in, as well as flexible program areas. There's a design with these project areas and there's an integrated special needs program throughout the, the floors. So there's been a very positive response to what has been designed. Um, and even the three floor design, I thought people might say, what, three, three story school? Um, a couple have said, well, the fourth and fifth graders get to be the privilege of being on the top. They'll be really excited. And, um, and people talked about growing up in schools that were like that. So we have, so the, the big thing is that um, it's a $98 million total cost, 43 million, we hope from the facility grant. And so the town is on, has to find the way to pay for the other 55 million. And some of that will be these tax incentives and the Eversource. But it will be a real, it has to be, we don't have enough internal money to do this without going out to the taxpayers. Thank you. Steve? What's the size of the, the PV system that's planned on the rooftop and parking lots? Do you happen to know in, in KW? Uh, I should have that in another slide. Um, I can get that back to you. It's. It's, uh, Laura may have it. Um, I do have it. So it's just a question of me pulling it up. And this okay. is where you, you hit, I, I can, while, while I'm searching, I can get you, um, cause it's in 
multiple pieces. Yeah, keep keep asking. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the only other thing I wanted to say was, <clears throat> do your best to allow the school kids to tour the building as it's being constructed. Yep. <clears throat> Um, we did that when we were building the Kern Center at Hampshire campus, and that was just fascinating to watch it go up. And, and it made the workers <clears throat> more proud of what they were doing. They were able <clears throat> to show it off while they were building it. That was really, really neat. That's great. <clears throat> um, given that Kathy needs to leave, does anybody have, have else have questions for her or else I can just go through the calcs I did? Okay. Um, oh yeah, go ahead, Jesse. <clears throat> it, I, I, this is great, and thank you. This is really helpful for us. Is there? Are you asking for anything? Like, is there anything? Oh, easy, why am I? Why I am I in front of you? We can't, Absolutely. We can't do everything. I, um, I came to you because I would love it. Um, at one point. Uh, at one point, Stephanie and I think Laura, a few other people attended one of our net zero meetings and said, when we got to this stage, you all might be able to help to put out a layperson's uh, piece on this is a great idea for kids and this is a great idea for the town from the perspective of climate action. Um, and it, I can draft a piece like that, but since I am not one of the people that is known for having come up with a net zero bylaw, or I've never designed a building or built a building or measured a greenhouse gas. So I think something simple coming out. So when, when, when Laura offered to do this calculation, um, you know, again, if, if something were drafted, I'd be glad to be a co-author if you wanted to make sure you've described the building right. But so the ask would be something that, um, to the climate action community talks about this school. Um, and again, and, and not on a technical level. So something, some, you know, when I see GS, uh, greenhouse gas production or whatever the acronym is, get rid of the acronyms and just tell people what it is, <laughs> you know, clean, clean air, quiet building, thermal comfort, whatever, um, you know, on this. So I think it would be great if, um, at whatever level you could produce that, if you produce it and put a, yes, we all agree, you know, and I will send you what you ask, it's on the kilowatt hours. You know, I have a memory of a number, but instead of saying it and being wrong, I will get it to you because I had to look at the, um, it's, it's under, there was a certain federal credit. You didn't get as much if you were a very large system, we were under the system on, on PV. Um, and so I'm, I'm remembering we, we have an exact estimate and ooh, I know I can divide it by, <laughs> I can divide it by the annual cost if we had to pay for it. Um, but anyway, I'll get it to you right after the meeting. Um, and, and Kathy, you need it by May 2nd, I assume, right? Or earlier? Well, you know, we need it before whatever, yes, whatever you would put out in terms of we calculated based on this, I can quickly put into a fact sheet and someone else, um, I am limited as a counselor from using council time, my council computer <laughs> to promote this. I can spend as much time on this <laughs> as I want to, as long as I switch to my other computer. <laughs> And so I, I can't say, oh my gosh, this is the best thing we could imagine. It is, will be the town's first net zero public building. Um, so anything you can put out that then could be turned into something simple for other people. I mean, people want to know what is a net zero school? Um, you know, what, why would we want to have one of those? Um, so those are the kinds of questions we're doing in FAQs. So sooner better than later, um, but uh, because it's, it will help people understand that this is an investment with a return to it. I'm, I'm an economist and it's hard for me to avoid using those words, but I see a real return both in a much better school for our kids and a place to learn in a climate return for us. It's a community resource. We're re reconstituting the fields and they're, they're big community fields. 
and uh, stormwater drainage. There's some environmental, there's some paths. Um, I think there's an amazing opportunity to teach about uh, flora, fauna, and everything on this site. Um, so just trying to think about what it means to have an elementary school that is embracing all of that uh, would be great. Thank you for all your work on it, Kathy. It's really been a, an amazing process to watch you shepherd it through. And I know Mothers Out Front is very excited to see this first zero energy building actually. Well, you know, and we, uh, you know, and, and I, do, I, I will leave you as a parting thing, but I've gotten so enthusiastic about the actual everything about that. Um, one of the people said, are there also educational benefits for the kids? <laughs> you know, and I go, well, yeah, the entire school is designed around the children, <laughs> you know, and teaching and programs, um, but they will also be inhabiting a building that will have all sorts of features. I mean, I was just told the other day that the wiring in Fort River, in Wildwood, but presumably Fort River, also is so old, it won't um, support modern Wi-Fi systems. Um, and they can't go up through the ceiling to rewire it because there's asbestos in the ceiling and they would have to do $1.6 million of hazmat removal. So what they've done, if you'd go into Wildwood, they've run little conduits along the wall. So if they need a new plug, some, you know, so they're doing wire, they're doing retrofitting because they can't get in and just rewire it. So it needs, it needs our rough estimate um, is in the 70 to $80 million worth of it of, um, between HVAC systems, ceiling, insulation, plumbing, electrical wiring, um, its systems are pretty shot and it doesn't have much daylight in a lot of the spaces. So, so I'm, I'm gonna leave you with that, um, with strong educational benefits, but have Laura walk you through either now or at your next meeting. And the number she's trying to generate will be one I will immediately put in um, a uh, uh, frequently asked questions fact sheet, Laura. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Bye, Kathy. everyone. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, so um, I can share my screen here. I think what I would. Uh, Laura, Stephanie had a question. So. Oh, so good, Stephanie. Sorry, I'm just I'm thinking about the fact that we had to, uh, and I know this is a little um, disjointed, but that we had to interrupt Adrian. Yeah, I know. I think we should. This, we just because she's sitting and waiting, yeah. if you don't mind, Laura. Thanks, sorry. Let's do that, yeah. Thanks, Adrian, for waiting. Of course, very interesting. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I just wanted to update you all on the outreach plan. Um, March is going to be a busy month, so you've all seen this graphic before, and, you know, it's the same process. Um, it was used in developing the CARP, kind of moving from informing through consulting and involving the community. Um, so in terms of informing uh, the project going live in the next couple of days, you know, we're going to have the project website. Um, a draft is live now, but we're not, uh, we're not getting the word out there yet um, because we're just tweaking a couple items on it still. Uh, we're going to be, we've been working closely with the Amherst um, Director of Communication to get a press release together, send out, you know, um, digital flyers to community groups. Um, we're also going to be sending out um, postcards to residences and um, in town. Social media will be updated and then flyers will be um, both physical flyers will be posted at, at certain public locations and apartment complexes. And then also digital flyers will be going out to the town network. Um, and so that's about 300 employees. And then they also share that information if they um, support some type of volunteer board. So um, I don't think, you know, you haven't seen a lot yet about this public outreach, but it's coming very soon. And then I think you're gonna be seeing it um, kind of all over the place. Um, we are going to have a virtual information presentation <laughs> March 13th, so that's going to be on the community calendar soon, um, and that will be a, a presentation about the project in general. Um, some brief history on, on, on you guys, on the Solar Bylaw Working Group, kind of what the town is 
is doing kind of broadly why we're looking at solar. Um, and then information about how to take the survey, how to participate, um, and how to, how to get your opinion registered. Um, and the in your meeting packets are the slides for that presentation, um, which will have some polling um, involved. So there will be um, some audience participation by answering questions that will update um, live on the slides. In terms of moving into consulting um, the community, we are going to have content on Engage Amherst. Um, and that's going to have interaction again. So people can talk to each other, they can talk to us, you know, and we will be able to capture that information and download it, include it in the report at the end. Um, and then that survey that um, we worked on together. So that survey will be available. Um, it has been translated and it will be available in English, Spanish, traditional Chinese, and simplified Chinese. Um, and at that, um, the public need in the meeting, uh, the virtual meeting, there will also be um, live interpretation. Uh, with them, we're gonna have two community workshops. So those are going to be in the Woodbury room at the Jones Library um, on Saturday, March 18th, and on Thursday, March 23rd. Uh, so those, those two workshops, they're really gonna be like an open house drop-in workshop. So there'll be um, interactive activities for people to do, but we really geared this to make it easy for people to participate. They can come in for five minutes and do one activity and still get their opinion, um, you know, kind of documented and heard. If they're shy, you know, it doesn't have to be in front of a big group. Um, we're trying to make it, you know, really uh, easy entry for people to come and participate. That's our that's our whole goal. Um, we are going to have some language translation available there as well, um, along with children's activities. Again, just want to be inclusive and we want people to be able to swing by the library, bring their kids, not worry about childcare, um, and and kind of take part in this effort. So. We're gonna have a QR code on just about everything. Um, as I said, our website is kind of draft live. So we are finalizing it um, and that it, it will be up in the next uh, day or two along with the full, full media blitz um, ahead of that first workshop. So that is the plan. Thank you. Yeah, great, Adrian. Good, good to see um, all this in place and about to move forward. I just had a quick question on the two public meetings in the library. Are they basically going to be duplicate, duplicates of each other, um, so people can come to one or the other? They're different times, obviously, or they're or they're different uh, formats or or content. They are the same meeting, so they'll be the same activities, and um, yeah, the, we wanted to make it easy for people to be heard. So same activities, same information, both meetings. So you're not gonna miss out on one versus the other. Perfect. Catherine. Yeah, just wanted to mention that there'll also be refreshments available. So there'll be some food for people as well. Um, everything is in the one room. So, um, you know, the, the children's activities will be in the same uh, room as the actual, um, table stations where people can go and, and sort of engage in the effort. And the idea is that it's going to be a fun interactive um, session. And so people can move at their own pace. They can also do as much. They can do it anonymously if they want. They don't have to be. Um, we want to make sure it's a safe space for people. So um, people can have different levels of literacy. It's very, very um, equitable approach to engaging people and getting their opinions and input on the on this whole process. Yes, Steve. Just a question on the date of the presentation. Is that March 8th or 13th? It's March 13th. Um, the draft slides that you had in your meeting packet um, were March 8th, but um, okay. it, we've moved it to March 13th just for um, easier facilitation of, of getting the Okay. It says March 8th on the website you just referenced. Right. That's one of the tweaks. That's why okay. it's on the draft website. Thank you.
Okay, uh, so no more questions. Well, Adrian, thank you for hanging around. I apologize for the shift in the agenda here. Thank you. Thanks. Laura, back to you. Okay, great. Um, so I think there are, um, in my mind, two things that we could do. Um, thing one is just to have some numbers available and talking points available that we can give to Kathy to put on um, the fact sheets that she was describing. The other thing I think we could do if we're willing is we could write a um, op-ed from ECAC to the paper, just noting, not asking people to vote one way or the other, but noting that this building does help support the climate goals and ambitions of the town. Um, so I did share in the packet a Excel document that, um, as I was telling Kathy, I was like, I think our group will want to know all the numbers and then we can take all the numbers and turn them into something that is more <laughs> understandable to the general public. Um, so I just wanted to be fully transparent and share that with you all. So um, this spreadsheet kind of has several tabs that include both the oil and natural gas calculations from the current buildings. So I got data from the school on natural gas usage and oil usage. Um, the most recent data was not for a year that they were fully in school because kids were out of school from March of 2020 to April of 2022, is that right? I don't know, it was a long time. So um, we, we uh um april 2021 so anyway so i had to use some older years but i took a three-year average across both the natural gas usage and the oil usage electricity calculations i did the same thing um you can see here the factor sources i used for the different emission factors and the town and total numbers related to our greenhouse gas inventories so anyone who's so inclined can look through this and make sure I did all the calculations right. I did share it with Steve and I think he did a check, but um, if you're interested, please do. Um, but the data summary tab is where I sort of laid out some talk, some key points in my opinion. So the first part here is, you know, just some high level points, the current Wildwood School runs on oil and electricity and contributes X amount of carbon dioxide equivalents. Fort River has a similar number based on its natural gas and electricity usage. Um, the two buildings combined are half of our of the annual GHG emissions for Amherst from municipal buildings. And I um, channeled Jesse to look up the fact that they two buildings emit as much as energy to run 300 average homes so they're definitely quite energy hogs <laughs> um or in ghg hogs i should say yeah jesse um i think you're but you're that's even conservative because you're not including the fugitive emissions from the gas exactly so these we so I would um, encourage you to do. <laughs> it's very difficult to find an emission factor that includes those. So I looked for it. Um, but yes, we could certainly talk about that. I mean, I think if you footnote it and say how you came up with it, it seems reasonable. But yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, wait. Yeah, I think this is great too. Um I, I um I'm just trying to get a sense of the relative sizes of the two schools because I am, given the fact that one runs on oil, one runs on natural gas, I would think the oil one would be a lot more greenhouse gas emitting, and they seem to be comparable unless unless it's a, uh, substantially smaller. 
of a school? I believe they're the same size or reason or about the same size. So, and Steve also had a question about the natural gas numbers, thinking they looked a little small. Um, so we can double check. Yeah, just to double check, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have the emission factors is the same for both of them and that can't be right. If one is using oil and one is using natural gas on the second spreadsheet, or maybe that's, oh, maybe that's electric. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. So the factor sources are the emission factors. So the natural gas number is this, and oh, okay. the oil number is that. Yeah, right. All right, never mind. I'm looking at the wrong thing. I just opened it for the first time. Apologies. And, oh yeah, yeah, it's waiting. No. And also, while my hands hasn't been put down yet, um, I'm wondering, is, is there a, a secondary check from the greenhouse gas inventory um, that Stephanie uh, did or, and, and the um, folks from uh, in New Hampshire did a number of years ago? Did that break out the individual big buildings like the schools? And I'm just wondering whether that would be a, a, another a second check um, on this analysis. I don't recall. We'd have to um, take a look, but we could easily do that. I've got the data set and I could share it with Laura. Yeah, good. Yeah, so it would be helpful. Um, I shared the raw data with, with Steve, but happy to share it with anybody else who wants to do. Before we put in these numbers out, I definitely want to make sure other people's eyes have looked at them to make sure we've done the calculations correctly. So, um, and I think that's a good idea, Dwayne. So, um, we can check that Excel file from the 2016 inventory as well, just to do another double check. Laura, what's what's the source of the data? Where did you get it? So the source of the data comes from the um, Rupert, the facilities manager for the schools, oh. and it is in like um, sort of it's coming from invoices, right? So it's the invoice from Berkshire Gas and from whoever we get our oil from. Yeah, so both Eversource and Berkshire Gas, if you can get access, have online systems. You can go back and look at three years worth of data on their platforms if there's a way to get access to those accounts. The oil invoices are a little more difficult, as you said. They're they're sort of sporadic deliveries, and I just wondered if you know a few invoices here and there might have gotten left out of the stack, not counted. So possibly you could check with the oil supplier and see if, with the school's permission, they would provide you a, a list from their accounting system that might you know, double check that the pile of invoices you got is is complete. Yeah, that's a good a good point. Maybe let's and then we can start with maybe looking at the data that that Stephanie has and see how they compare. Certainly, um, and we have a lot more years of data, so we can also sort of look at the trends of that and see if there's anything that looks um, yeah. normal. Stephanie. Yeah, I also um, have access to Mass Energy Insight data, so the the gas. Uh, electric utility and Berkshire gas information gets automatically loaded. Oh. There, there. I will say that it's not a perfect system because there have definitely been some challenges in the past um, where information didn't get entered correctly. So uh, I think that it's been updated though. So I'd be happy to um, help, you know, work with you and show you some of that if that would be helpful too. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, barring that we need to check the numbers, I it, it think it's clear that these two buildings use a lot of energy um, and that the new building is going to be using all of electricity to do heat, cooling, and powering the building. I think it's important to continue to highlight the cooling function of the new building, that it does not exist in the current buildings, um, mainly because that's a resiliency issue, right? Two years ago, or whenever it was, there's been years where kids have had to leave school early or have a day off because it's too hot in the buildings in September. So, um, you know, we have to address cooling and this is um, going to do that. I think the other, I think 
And just on that note, the resiliency and the educational aspects of the building are both pieces of our plan that we highlighted as important. Um, and I think if we do write an op-ed, we can also highlight those features. So um, from my calculations, just your, using current electricity factors, I, the new building will save us 20% of um, 20 percent of emissions versus the old buildings. And then of course we also have, and we know, and I think we can say in some respects that without um, switching to ground source heat, heat pumps and running heating, cooling and powering the building with electricity is really the only way to get the building to be net zero. Um, and as we continue to green the grid, we will continue to see emission reductions associated with um, this building and any building that any building we have in, in town that operates on electricity. Hey, so, hey, hey Laura, you, so yeah. you're saying the new building is 1900 metric tons of uh, carbon emissions. What was it for the current two buildings? I thought it was less than that. Um, but it's replacing both of them. Yeah. So. Okay, so total, yeah, yeah, so total of 2,400 against 19. Yeah. Um, we do need to be careful about how we talk about the solar um, because we don't know yet what the, um, what the final arrangement will be in terms of recs and things of that nature. So I think it's safest for us to just focus on the fact that this building is contributing solar to our town and we need, and contrib contributing solar to the grid. And as we continue to add more grids, we can say the building is net zero, but I don't think we can say that that solar is helping us meet our climate goals um, directly. But I think we can talk about it in a way that is clear. So- well, You're saying that yeah. because, um, will be selling the recs to offset. I don't think we have the opportunity to keep the recs under the SMART program. So I don't even think it's an option. Would the school buy recs to replace those? Probably not. <laughs> so they could, but given the budget crisis, I don't think they will. Dwayne? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to uh, double down on what Laura said that um, under under the smart program, <clears throat> the recs are really going to the utility company at this point. Um, but it would be, I think, we could, you know, once um, we get the uh, data on the size of the PV system, we could estimate, you know, how much energy that will be producing over the course of a typical year. And it, you know, at least say something like we will be using grid electricity, but we will be uh, that electricity will be, um, you know, comparable to the amount that we will be putting on the grid as clean energy um, from the PV system if it es essentially balances each other. Yeah. To add that for those of you who aren't aware, the both the EPA and the Federal Trade Commission sort of have highly specified language about how you can talk about these things um, to prevent companies and organizations from greenwashing, you know, claiming that they're using renewable energy when in fact they're not. So it's it can be very tricky to explain these things um, and get the nuance correct. Jesse? Oops. Yeah, so <clears throat> a couple, couple quick things. One, still not entirely sure how Laura has a 28 hour day and the rest of <laughs> us just a 24 hour day, but always impressed. Um, I want to, one, the, the thing about the, the story around the electric, you know, being electric in and of itself is not necessarily great, you know, especially if it's coming from gas and coal, but being electric as as a sort of future proofing as the way to accommodate a changing energy climate you know you, we know how to make renewable electricity we still don't know how to make renewable fossil fuels i think that 
it's investing in a future if if it's not creating an immediate um solution and then my last question actually is um what's I, i'm sort of a, again similar to with kathy like what's the ask like what can we do to sort of leverage and capitalize and and sort of maximize the work that you've done how do we support this turning into something that's gets out in the world etc cetera, etc cetera? yeah so i think if folks are comfortable with us moving forward with the idea of developing um a type of letter to the editor or some something of that nature. Um, I would suggest that I work with Vasu to draft something up that then we can share with the group and get feedback. Um, maybe even pulling you in, Jesse, as someone who's good at detechnifying some of this stuff. Um, and then we can review it at an upcoming meeting and decide it. And if we agree, we can vote on it. And then I think Visu could submit it to the paper on behalf of ECAC as the chair. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, I was going to recommend Jesse's input as well, because I know we've talked in the past about detechnifying, right? About some of these, what does tonnage mean in layman's terms, right? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Or um, Andra and Jesse. Um, uh, I mean, it may be obvious, but wouldn't it be good for us to just vote, make a statement that we strongly support um, the school and um, urge the residents to vote for it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we can, Andra. I don't know what that's going to do. That's why I was asking Kathy about pushback that the that she's heard, and it just seems like it's around property taxes. I mean, it, I mean, I don't see a problem with it, but I don't know what value it would add. I think we can help create the FAQs, which will help address some of the questions that the community might have. Um, and obviously, I mean, if we're talking op-ed, then there's going to be ECAC's approval, really, uh, in the op-ed, too. I mean, it, one thing I, I would, I, I think it it matters. I think that having, you know, it known that um, as many bodies as possible, you know, in the town, support this i yeah, think that. we have to check i mean when we had this discussion last time about the library we i thought the understanding was that as a town committee we can't make a recommendation on how to vote but we could have if we had chosen to at that time which we didn't we could have come out with a statement about the climate benefits of the building and how this helps us meet our climate goals yeah. like that feels well within our charge um and we could make a vote on that you know that we think this helps us meet our climate goals and then we write the op-ed i think both of those are well within our within our abilities as a town committee of course us individually can do whatever we want <laughs> yeah uh laurie and steve yeah, I just wanted to say that I am really comfortable with writing an op-ed or passing a motion that says we support the development of this school, we support the building of this school. I am much less comfortable with encouraging people to vote for a tax increase um, in this day and age and with the inequities we already have. I actually I this is the first we this can... is the first this is the first I've heard that there was going to be a tax increase over this. So I guess not surprising, but it's the first I've heard about it. So I'm still trying to process that <laughs> myself. Yeah, Steve? This is a little off that topic, um, but Laura, does anybody know what the plan is for the old school buildings and the sites? Because I, I worry that they'll get leased out to some other entity and the energy use will just continue in those old mm. decrepit buildings. Yes, Steve, that's a great point. And I have it listed here, but I forgot to speak to it. 
um, we need, I think we need to say that clearly that these savings will only be realized if both of these buildings are discontinued in their current form. Um, whether that means someone takes them and updates them or tears them down and builds new, like, but they can't be kept, they can't even be kept in working order, right? Um, because the the Fort River, my understanding is the Fort River School will be torn down because they're going to rebuild the fields there. It's right. the Wildwood School that's more uncertain, but it can't be you know it can't be kept in an in a like with heat running or anything because that's going to be using oil. Right. Yeah, got to watch out for that. That yeah. they could make a promise now, and that promise could change later down the the road. So I, I think the we we can't ask or in, infer or anything. We can't tell anyone how to vote about anything. I think as a, as a group, and just to, to clarify, so we wouldn't be asking people to vote. I think I, I think what we're doing is um, what we're proposing to do would be also our first kind of public statement as a group i mean we did have a little bit of you know we had a letter at the beginning of the carp but for the most you know an op-ed would be this would be our first statement um so i think that's pretty exciting and i hope it's not our last um but i so it seems like who's who's in charge of vetting the the article for to, to make sure it's not breaking any of our our town kind of conflict of interest et cetera et cetera I'm not sure even what it is but I know we're not allowed to tell people to vote for anything yeah we'll definitely have to run it by Stephanie I don't think I don't know Stephanie your thoughts attorney Don Allison yeah that's, that's true we have attorney <laughs> that's, that's true you on that one <laughs> no. No. I, no, I'll wait my turn. You can. <laughs> Seems like people have been doing that to conflict of interest training this week. Huh? <laughs> I, I wonder. Actually, I'll speak up. I, I, I mean, I, I see this as two different pieces. One of which is clearly our bailiwick. The other of which is something that's different. I mean, it's ours in the sense that we are residents of the town. So the first question is really the question of, do we need a new school? And why do we need a new school? Because, because if you're going to the town for an override, um, one, you've got, to, you've got to convince the population that yes, we need a new school. That's really not our bailiwick. I think our bailiwick, and I don't even know if this is accurate, is convincing the public, if the public believes we need a new school, that the cost, the size of the override is not going to be significantly affected by a net zero building. Now, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I think if you're pushing this out to the general public, there's a lot of people that are going to hear net zero. They're going to hear, you know, all the things that are important to us. And they're going to say, wow, this is costing a lot more money. And that means the override is going to be a lot more than it would be if we just built a conventional new school. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the rebates and what everything else we're talking about ultimately does to the reduction in the, in, in, in the size of the override. And I don't know how all those pieces fit together, but those are really important pieces to the everyday, the people that live in this community who are being asked to agree to raise their property taxes. Um, and I don't know how we do that, Laura, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, I certainly am 100% behind, you know, how important it is to have you know, net zero buildings, but how do you sell that to a community in economic terms? And that yeah. is the hard part. 
And I think that's where, and I think when we know how much the solar is, I think there's two answers to that. One is that graphic that Kathy showed shows that with the incentives, let's assume we need the new school. Let's take that off the table. We can either get a new school with gas or a new school with heat pumps. And right now it's cheaper with all the incentives to get a new school with heat pumps. That's, that's fact. So we can. I'm sorry, but yeah, but is that, I I, I mean, you know, it was my mind works and I, you know, okay. We're raising the money to build the school. Right. And that's Mm going to require an override. And then we get all these incentives back. What, where do they go? So. Does it reduce the amount we have to raise? Yes. Yeah, so because actually, that, that's, that's the way we're doing it. We're basically yes. saying because you've got to pay. I mean, my understanding of rebates and incentives is you pay up front and then they give it back to you afterward. So luckily, yesterday, the finance committee, I believe, voted to take five million out of reserves so that we don't have to the tax payers don't have to pay up. So we're we're expecting to get around 4 million in incentives. So we we're sort of paying that forward. We're saying here's 5 million from the reserves so that the taxes don't have to go up quite as much and when we get that 4 million back we'll put that back into reserves. So they we are they are trying to do that so it's not funny money. If yeah, you I mean these are the kind of questions that I would think that somehow or other the education between mm-hmm. now and May has to take place because you know lots of people will think, oh yeah, here's what's going to happen. They're going to raise my taxes to pay for the building, and then they're going to get their four million dollars back, and they're not going to give it back to me. It's just going to sit in the town coffers, and it's it's that kind of a mindset that has to be addressed. And I don't know how you do it because it's hard, but mm-hmm. I'm done talking. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, Don, but I also don't think that's something that we should be thinking about at this point. But I completely agree. Oh, Jesse. I don't I don't think it's our bailiwick. Yeah. I, yeah. I think though that when like as Andra said, if 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 our statement is there going even gonna be that that we're supporting, you know, the the construction of this school. I, I don't know. I, 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 it just means we got to be really careful as to what we say. We're we're supporting net zero buildings in in. in yeah, and I think yeah. your point that net zero. I think we do have to counter the notion <clears throat> that net zero is more expensive. Yes. So I think we should figure out a way to talk about that in this if we can. And and I just to add to that, it sounds like it's less expensive capital costs, less expensive operational costs. And to, and to, how do we feed both of those back in to like, how does that benefit, you know, Joe Amherst on a day-to-day basis if, if, it, if it's, you know, so that's a good, really good point, Don, but I think the operational costs, I know, Laura, you've been working on that as well. It's the savings, and as the, you know, as the costs of energy go up, those operational savings go up as well. And it, well, I'm actually worried about that, right? Because that's the one unspoken downside, which is how much less expensive would it be to run the building on gas right now? Not less expensive. To run it on gas? Compared to heat pumps, a geo, or maybe geothermal is, yeah, okay, geothermal, that's right. I forgot it's geothermal. It's not we can't put something. We can't put something on the roof that makes natural gas. That's right, that's right. And, and you can't put the solar. The roof that makes so between the solar and the geothermal, yes, you're going to win. That seems right. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> well, I still think you have to be careful about the operating costs, Jesse, because every day Joe Amherst is going to look at this thing and say, Great, we saved six hundred thousand dollars in operating costs this year. Our taxes aren't going down. The budget's going to, you know, it, it, that's that's a that's a in my line of work, that's a smoke screen. That's how you it, that. Well, yeah, no, I understand, but it it it's maybe that's something. Maybe that keeps the taxes from going up next time. 
because we now are investing in, in infrastructure that costs less to operate. So the long-term tax burden, I mean, it, yeah, it's all smokescreen and to some degree, but it's a good, I, I like the counterpoint, I must admit, we gotta be able to answer it. Yeah, and the question is, do we wanna write this topic, right? I'm, uh, because of all the concerns that Don brought up. Uh, Andra, and then Stephanie. I think that the costs are absolutely our concern as the energy committee in town. Um, we educate people about the tremendous incentives that are now coming through from um, state and federal, um, mostly federal. And that because of that, being this highly efficient building um, and using, you know, clean heat, we're reducing the amount of the override. That's a selling point that is ours to make, it's a, you know, a point that's ours to make. Stephanie? So I'm just going to kind of reiterate some of what everyone's already been saying, but back to Laura's very sort of simple point that right in the beginning when we were talking with Kathy and we were attending some of the early meetings about this building construction, the whole concern was that people need to understand that a net zero building doesn't automatically mean that it's going to cost more and that people need to understand um, how incentives affect that upfront cost. So again, I think the, the thing is that a lot of this, especially, I mean, I know what we're talking about and it all sounds really complicated. So for the average person, you need to be sort of bringing this down to basic language so people understand what it means and what the incentives mean. And I do think to Andrew's point, that, that is very much a responsibility of this group to help people understand the differences in the technology and why that matters and how it impacts cost and savings. You just have to make it really simple and break it down into very, very digestible um, or break it all down to very digestible language. Um, so that's what I, you know, that's how I, I do agree that I, I do think it's, that's part of the whole educational piece of what you do, right? Yeah, okay. Any conflict of interest, Stephanie, with writing an op-ed because you're not because the point is you should not be advocating that people do this and vote for it what you're doing is just educating people yeah. to understand the difference in the technology and the difference in what those costs mean so for people to understand why it doesn't mean it's automatically a more expensive building and prospect. So you're not advocating one way or the other, you're just simply giving them the information that helps them to understand the differences between different technologies. Don? Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%, Stephanie. I, I mean, I really do. I, I, that's an important issue for people that, you know, we need a new school in Amherst. You know, am I four kids all went to the Amherst Public Schools. My daughter was at Fort River. You know, I, 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 we, we definitely, and it was old then, um, and she's 37, so I can't even imagine, you know, what it's like now. Um, but the, the choice to build a new school, what we have to do is make it clear to people that building it net zero is actually going to cost less than if you build it with a fossil fuel, uh, you know, a, a fossil fuel burning uh, heating and, and air conditioning system. And, and that's, that to me is really important. And I, I think it is our job to educate people. If you're going to build a new school, it's going to be less expensive and better, you know, overall for a number of reasons, it's going to be better to, to build it net zero. Not, not to mention that you have to, but it's better to do it that yeah. way. Thanks, Don. And Dwayne, I, I got to interrupt real quickly, Dwayne. It's the point is, you can't use the net zero as a reason to say, 
Like, oh, they passed the net zero bylaw and now it's too expensive for us to build the new school. Yeah. No. It, it, so it, yeah. I'll just be real quick. I agree with everything and and uh, certainly that we, we, we should not um, say anything about you should vote this way or not. That's not our role, but our role is to sort of use our, provide our expertise to educate um, the community. Um, and I agree with everything that was just said. I do wonder about, there is, you know, this conspiracy theories are all over the place. So, you know, this idea that um, the town can take these, well, that, that I think Don brought up is conceivably the town can take these incentive monies and these operational savings and spend them on something else um, and, and not necessarily drive down the costs associated with, with the school or hire more teachers or reduce the um, tax override that they're seeking um, from, from the uh, community members at this point. So I do wonder whether we can articulate that, that that is not, uh, that that these incentives and that the operating savings will be helped is, it is in fact helping to reduce the um, override that's necessary. That being said, we if we can get, um, get some input from the um, town, the financial folks or from the town manager, that that is indeed the plan. Um, then you, you, we, we can sound a bit more credible uh, along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I think we can certainly say that about the um, override because of the vote yesterday with the 5 million. I think the operating cost is a little harder. But what I would suggest is that I work with Vasu and, and maybe loop Jesse in um, as appropriate to draft up something that then we can all look at and start to pick apart. Jesse, does anyone know? Is there any published information about what what the cost per you know what of uh, uh, what the tax burden would be? Is has that come out yet? Is there estimates? Yes, there are. I don't know them off the top of my head, but I think they were in the paper like last week or something. Yeah, I was just reading that. Um, guys, I have to go at six thirty today. I really can't stay late, so. Yeah, know. let's let's move on to the next topic. And uh, so, Laura, I think we have a plan. Let's plan on reviewing with ECAC on April twelfth in that meeting. Does that work? Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lori. The Sustainability Festival. Just quick just word on signing sign up. up. Please sign, sign up, up right. and we'll deal with it next time. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, closing comments or updates, uh, Stephanie, that you want to highlight? I just want to good? tell you that I interviewed the fellows for both the greenhouse gas emissions inventory update and the um, building inventory and timeline for changing buildings out from fossil fuels. And um, I'm always so super, super impressed with the caliber of students that the UNH Sustainability Institute program um, is able to uh, to secure for these fellowships. They're amazing. And I feel like we had five candidates for two positions and they were all, I mean, any of them would be amazing. They're all really incredible. So I feel like we can't really lose. So I just wanted to share that. And uh, oh, Don, you had your hand raised. Yeah, well, I, just have a, I just have a quick update. Um, since I will not be at the next meeting when you would normally discuss PACE, <laughs> since I'm gonna be in, I think, Senegal when the next meeting happens. Um, either Senegal or the Gambia, I, I'm, I'm not completely clear on the um, on the itinerary, but um, I did wanna let everybody know that I, Claudia did get back to me from the chamber. She and I are meeting on Friday. <clears throat> she believes that she has a committee or will be able to come up with some sort of plan to share um, pace information with the business and development community in Amherst. And I will share that with you when I return from West Africa. That's all. Sounds good, Don. I'll probably see you at the Sustainability Festival then because I'm you will. five weeks. Yeah. I, I just signed up to set up for two hours, Lori. Um, Don, can I just jump in real quick? When is that meeting with Claudia? Uh, okay. Friday morning here. She's coming to my office, Stephanie. Okay. Um, I can send you the time tomorrow if you want to know. Um, yeah, just curious because I, I, yeah, you maybe weigh in if, or just, you know, 
be part I, of the I would love to. Yeah, I'm sorry that I didn't get no shoot back no, to me fine. yesterday, but I'll I'll shoot you an email tomorrow with the time. Okay. All right. All right. If I can do it, I will. Yep. Andra, anything that we can wrap up in 15 seconds? Your comments? Yeah, I just wanted to ask if we could have your um, email to the town manager about our vote without the special yep. stretch yep. code in the. Will do. Will do. Thank you. And then for uh, the agenda next, uh, the next meeting, I just have the annual report discussion on the timeline, Stephanie, and then the usual progress reports without Don. Well, but I, I think we, we'll we'll have the transportation um, report out because Stella is here today. I didn't have. Um, I I didn't get to do the legislative. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Sorry. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah. Any public comments? Um, yes, Martha Hanner, um, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, the Martha Hanner, real interesting discussion. So I just wanted to say that while you're, um, you know, writing something to, you know, extol this new building and so on, you might possibly want to include a, a chart or a comment from the Massachusetts state plan. There's one particular chart that shows graphically the extent to which buildings contribute a really large share of the greenhouse gases in the state. And that might be something you might want. I could email some of you the, ch the chart if you wanted and uh, you know how that has to decrease to meet the, the state's goals and so on. Uh, so just a suggestion, that's all. So uh, yeah. it sounds like a good idea for, for what you're going to do to, to write things up. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marta. And send it along to either me or Stephanie, yeah. and we can. Okay. Right. Thank you. Anyone else from the public interested in making a comment or asking a question? Please feel free to electronically raise your hand. Okay. Uh, no, I don't think there are any. Oh. oh. One more. Rudy, go ahead. I've. Oh. Hi, Rudy Perk. Rudy Perkins, can you hear me? Um, yes. Great. Uh, real quick, um, just for those of you who want to personally advocate for the the school, there is a new group out, yes, for AmherstSchools.org. You probably know about that, but if you go to that website, they have information, yes, for AmherstSchools.org, and also where you can volunteer and uh, donate, because it will take an effort to get this through. And secondly, at a broader level, um, the Climate Action Plan has a lot about trying to get other buildings and other owners of buildings to retrofit, to get rid of fossil fuels in their buildings. And I think if this committee doesn't take a strong uh, position, um, not necessarily have, I understand you have restrictions on voting, but extolling the virtues of the net zero and fossil free nature of this, our first building under the municipal bylaw, then how are you gonna talk other people into doing this? And how are you gonna talk other people into spending their personal finances directly to improve their buildings, make them fossil free, put in these new energy systems? I, I think this is our best example to lead the way for the rest of the town. And you all are a really good force to, to help lead that in the ways that you can and your constraints. So thanks so much. I hope you write a really strong op-ed. I'm looking forward to reading it. Thanks, Rudy. Okay, that's all we have the time for. Thank you everybody for dialing in. Have oh, a good evening. Thanks, Vasu. Thanks, Vasu. Thanks, Steph. Bye. Bye, everyone.